Last time on Graph Theory, we took a look at Prim's algorithm, which is a technique used to generate minimum spanning trees. Today, we're going to look at its cousin, Kruskal's algorithm, which also generates a minimum spanning tree, but takes a pretty different approach to the problem. You're watching another episode of Graph Theory. Hello and welcome back to Graph Theory. Today, we're going to be looking at Kruskal's algorithm, written in 1956 by Joseph Kruskal. The biggest difference between this algorithm and Prim's algorithm is that it does not have a starting point. Instead of starting at a point and growing a tree, Kruskal's algorithm actually looks at all the edges at once and picks the best from anywhere within the graph. So you can imagine what you have originally are a set of disconnected little trees. And eventually, as we pick more and more edges, they'll all join up to form our minimum spanning tree. So yeah, with that said, let's jump right in to see how this algorithm works. All right, let us jump into the trace of Kruskal's algorithm. So the first thing we want to do is to prepare our data structures. Basically, what we've done here is we've created a table called edge list, which is shown at the bottom of the screen here. Basically, for every edge in a graph, that is, every one of these connections, we add both things into the edge list. That is, the name of the edge itself, which in this case I've named it with the two vertices at the two ends of the edge, as well as the weight of the list. They're both added to the table, and what we've done is we've now sorted them according to the weight. Once that is done, we're actually going to go to the next step, which is not shown. Basically, we want to create a forest. A forest is a collection of trees. We want to add every vertex as a one element tree to the forest F. So currently, forest F consists of all these vertices as their own separate trees. They are not connected. What's going to happen is, as we trace onwards, well, they're going to get connected. So let's start with the for loop itself. For every edge in the edge list, so what we're going to do is we're going to start here and move our way down. If that particular edge connects two separate trees, then we join the two trees together. And implicitly, we accept that edge. So let's see this in action. First and foremost, what we have here is an edge called FK. And that is this edge right here. As you can see, this condition holds true because F and K were originally two different trees. So that's fine. This edge does connect two different trees. And as such, we can accept this edge, thus connecting these two trees. Moving on to D and G here, once again, they are two separate trees and we can connect them together. Notice that I color these a different color from these nodes here. That is because DG is its own tree. FK is its own tree. These two trees are not connected to each other. They have nothing to do with each other. So yeah, bear that in mind. As mentioned earlier, what we are doing here is we are creating many little separate groups. So right, next edge is EJ, this edge right here. Once again, different color because once again, it is a separate tree. But that's not the case when we move on to the edge AE. Notice down that this guy is the color of these guys because, well, Basically, we have just joined a one element tree with a two element tree. So we move on once again to HL, that is this edge here. We connect them into their own tree. Then J and K, this edge here. Notice what has just happened. We've actually connected two trees together. That is a tree consisting of A, E and J with a tree consisting of F and K. They are now connected into one five element tree. So I think you have a good picture of how this works now. As we trace on, all these trees are going to get merged together, giving us our final minimum spanning tree. So yeah, next we include the edge FG, which grows this tree even more. Then we get GH, which now connects, well, this tree to the rest. We now have one large tree that spans almost all the vertices in this graph. Moving on, we pick AB that just connects it to the existing tree. Same deal for CG and EI. 
So actually we have our minimum spanning tree. In fact, we can see visually that every node has now been connected. But the algorithm doesn't know. The algorithm needs to continue iterating until the end. So let's see what happens if we pick the edge BC. Now, the algorithm itself does not allow us to do this. As you can see, that edge needs to connect two separate trees. But, well, all this is already one tree, so there is no way we can pick this edge. So the algorithm prevents us from doing it. But let's say we want to do it anyway. Let's try and include this edge. And notice what happens. We have actually created a cycle. Now, a tree can never have a cycle within it, which is why, well, we definitely have to reject this edge. Let's actually, just for interest's sake, go through the rest of the edges and see if they create cycles. As you can see, FJ does create a cycle here, AF creates a cycle here, DH creates a cycle here, as does GK, which creates a cycle here. And that explains why we cannot pick any one of these edges. We have to stop where we've stopped earlier. So yeah, that is Kraskill's algorithm. So yeah, in fact, that's it for the trace. Unlike Prims, we didn't have to look at two different versions because, well, Kraskill's algorithm is more or less intuitive. However, there is one thing I want to emphasize, and that is the cycle problem. As mentioned in the trace, towards the end, we saw how certain edges have to be rejected because they form cycles within the minimum spanning tree, and that would break the whole fact that it is supposed to be a tree. However, I feel like that trace may have given you the false impression that that only occurs at the very end. And that is in fact not true. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a much smaller trace of Kraskill's algorithm on a graph I've specially designed to have this problem for the purposes of demonstration. Let's take a look. So alright, let us prove to ourselves that a cycle can in fact occur early, before the algorithm is ready to terminate. So, well, we trace this from the top again by first creating our edge list. Obviously, AC is fine, as is CD. But look at what happens when we go to AD. We cannot pick this, and obviously, the algorithm is not ready to terminate yet because our tree has not extended its way over to B. But we cannot pick this edge because that creates a cycle here. Instead, we have to move on. We have to pick this edge instead. And well, that basically allows our algorithm to terminate. So yeah, what you've seen here is we actually have to reject a cheap edge in favor for a much more expensive edge because well, adding this edge would create a cycle and that would break the fact that we wanted a tree. So yeah, that is the cycle's problem, which we have now seen can occur at any point. So even though we have all the edges sorted by their weight, we may have to reject an edge with a very small weight for a much heavier edge because of the fact that choosing that edge will not help us, it will create a cycle. So let's talk implementation. We've seen that Prim's algorithm can be implemented with a priority queue. When it comes to Kraskill's algorithm, we actually use what is known as a disjoint set data structure. We're not actually going to explore that data structure in depth because there is quite a lot of discussion that can get pretty involved, so instead we're going to summarize it as such. In fact, a disjoint set data structure is just a way of organizing information such that originally everything starts off as its own set. As we query for items within this data structure, we actually end up combining them into the same set. After certain iterations, we end up with very few sets that are actually the product of multiple sets joined together. So I think you can immediately see why this data structure is so useful when it comes to implementing Kraskill's algorithm, because that is essentially how the algorithm operates. We start off with everything separate, and then we start to join them together. And eventually, after enough iterations, everything gets joined together in the form of a minimum spanning tree. So then we can move on to the time complexity discussion, which once again is highly dependent on the data structure. Even though we've only considered Kraskill's algorithm implemented on disjoint set data structures, 
The truth is, a disjoint set can be implemented in several different ways. And depending on how you do it, the time complexity is different. So once again, similar to Prim's algorithm, we're only going to look at the number of operations the algorithm itself does. And we're going to express it in terms of how long it takes for the disjoint set data structure to do its job. So let's take it from the top. First and foremost, we need to sort all the edges. Now, this one is already, well, something that can vary a lot. Obviously, we have seen sorting algorithms on this channel, and, well, the slower sorting algorithms will take OE squared. Faster algorithms could take E log E, and perhaps we can even use faster algorithms. Or in the best case, well, our input has already been sorted, and this step can be entirely eliminated. So, we don't actually know. Ultimately, at the end of the day, well, we just know we need to sort E edges and express the time in terms of that. The rest of the algorithm is just a bunch of disjoint set operations. First, every time we pick up an edge, we need to trace it to its two connected vertices and see if they belong in the same set. We need to do this a total of E times. Second, if we find that these two vertices are not in the same set, then we need to perform a join operation so that they do end up in the same set. We have to do that at most E times. So the total number of operations looks something like this. Like the previous episode, we're going to look at some common time complexities of Kraskow's algorithm. And a lot of the time, we actually see O E log E or O E log V. As it turns out, the sorting step generally overwhelms. Oh, and incidentally, these two time complexities are actually equivalent. O E log E is the same as O E log V, because we can actually express E in terms of V. You see, in a graph, E must be less than V squared. The reason why this is so is because in a complete graph, that is, we try to stuff as many edges into the graph as possible, every vertex will have V minus 1 edges, because it will try to connect to every other vertex out there. There's a maximum number of edges, we cannot have more than that, which is why we can actually say E is less than V squared. So this gives us a relation between V and E. If we were to actually work it all out, we'll realize that when it comes to the domain of big O, they are actually equivalent. And as a result, we can say that O E log V and O E log E are actually the same thing. So yeah, there you go, that is Kraskow's algorithm. Next episode, we're going to actually take a look at two different minimum spanning tree algorithms. We're just going to very quickly run through them because they are sort of less popular algorithms. So yeah, I'll just cover them for interest's sake. That's all there is for this particular episode. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, you're watching 0612TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may want to check out a playlist of the other videos in this series. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.